Let's all stand if we would. Let's bow our heads and ask God just to be with us on this Easter Sunday. Father, how privileged we are to walk into a place like this and sense your divine presence. Christians all over the world are celebrating and saying, He is risen. He is risen. What hope that gives us today. Father, if we do not do anything else, I would pray, Father, in the brief moment that I have, that we will absolutely get that truth in our minds. You are risen. Your resurrection causes us hope for a brighter tomorrow. Your resurrection ensures that we will have our own resurrection one day. Your resurrection proves that what you said was true, that salvation is available, that eternal life is ours. But Father, there could be some in this room that do not know that. There could be one standing in this midst that has just come because it's Easter. But oh, what an Easter it could be. What a service it could be when the Holy Spirit of God invades a human heart and woos us and calls us to Christ. Father, today the service is not about us. It's not about any entity other than you. Lord, please. I would pray for all of those that are hurting. For all those that came this morning and maybe they woke up and it's just been a difficult day. God, I just pray that when we close these doors of a day, we can honestly say that you are here. That you showed up. Father, thank you for what we've already seen and partook of. Thank you for the special guest this morning. Thank you, Lord, for them making our service that much more special. But, Father, what we're counting on is you. What we're counting on you, Lord, is to work through this feeble preacher and to say the life-changing truths of eternal life. God, give us more of you and less of us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Each of us here this morning has a story to tell. Let me read you a story this morning by a man by the name of Derwin Gray. Derwin writes, Growing up on the west side of San Antonio, I believed in God, little g, the God of my football. The game was my ticket out of an early life saturated with violence, of, of, of addiction, abuse, and chaos. I was raised by my grandmother because my parents were only teenagers when I was born. They were children bringing a child into the world. As much as they wanted to care for me, the hurt and brokenness in their lives prevented them. Granny was a Jehovah Witness, so that was the religion I knew. After a while, even that went away. We were not poor, we were very poor. We didn't eat meals together. We didn't pray together. There would, there were good times, like when we'd go fishing or when my grandfather would come home after work in the evenings. But the time I was 13, however, I looked at my environment and told my grandmother, I'm going to do something with my life. Football was my way out of the hell I was living in. I believed in it would lift me into the heaven of the American dream. Football functioned as my savior. I gave it my love. I played well. I was loved by fans, and it gave me an identity. I was Derwin, the football player. It gave me significance. I was somebody because I was a great player. After football gave me a mission. My mission was, Derwin, you can go to college and make something of your life. During my sophomore year of high school, I started to do just that. I transferred to Judson High School in Converse, 
a suburb of San Antonio where I played for D.W. Rutledge, the high school Texas Hall of Fame coach. My senior year, I accepted a football scholarship at Brigham Young University. So you have a black kid from a lower social economic multi-ethnic context with a Jehovah Witness religious background attending a Mormon university. On January the 15th of 1990, during my freshman year at BYU, I met a beautiful young lady named Vicky. She would, uh, she was a javelin thrower on the track team. We fell in love fast and married on May the 23rd of 1992 during my senior year. The first wedding I ever attended was my own. At BYU, my goal had come through for me. I had an outstanding career and was later named to BYU football all ti- uh, all-time dream team. Plus, I loved the school. I had the girl of my dreams. I was making something out of my life. On April the 25th of 1993, I was drafted by the Indianapolis Colts to strong safety. I had made it. Then I met the preacher, a linebacker for the Colts in 1993. It was impossible not to notice a linebacker who would shower off, dry off, and wrap a towel around his waist, pick up his Bible, and ask those in the locker room, do you know Jesus? I would think that uh, uh, you would pay attention to him. I asked the veterans on the team about him, and they said, don't pay attention to him, that's just the preacher. I was at the point in my life I didn't want anything to do with Jesus or a man talking about him, so I tried to avoid him. One day after practice, I was sitting at my locker and saw the preacher, whose real name was Steve Grant, walking toward me. Rookie D, do you know Jesus, he asked. I pretended not to hear him, and I turned my back. He repeated the question, but this time he was at my locker. Even though I was not a churchgoer or involved in any religious group, I gave what I thought was a very religious answer. I'm a good person. I explained to Steve that I was the only man in my family who had not been to jail, who did not have a substance abuse problem, and who had graduated from high school and college and did not have a child outside of marriage. The preacher opened up his Bible and shared with me that uh, some verses from the Word of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Steve explained that according to the Bible, only God is good, and He is a standard of goodness and righteousness. Everyone else had sinned and fall short. This disturbed me, I says. Are you telling me that my normal comparison is to God and to not other people? He says, yes. God is perfect. What can I do to be perfect? And he answered, nothing. I said, I'm in big trouble. Rookie D, he says, now where you're starting to get it. You can't do anything to to reach a perfect God, but Jesus has done everything for you to come down to man to reach you. I said in silence. I needed time to think through what he was saying and what I was experiencing in my heart. Over the next five years, I watched Steve live out the gospel. When my teammates needed advice, they went to the preacher's locker. Steve was involved in a greater Indianapolis community. He displays Jesus in the way that he loved his wife and children. And he preached through his words and through his actions. The preacher preached, God's love finally crushed me. I had achieved the American dream only to realize it could not empower me to love my wife or forgive my father. My fame and money could not erase my sin, shame, guilt, fear, or insecurity. Then between 1995 and 1997, I started getting injured on the field. When a professional athlete's body starts to fail, he knows his career is coming to an end. I was letting my God, my football, down. I was unable to serve it. My body was now how I, how I made my living. As it began to give out, I was stripped of everything I thought it gave me meaning. I was left with nothing, even though I seemingly had everything. On August the 2nd of 1997, after a lunch at a training camp for my fifth season with the Colts, I walked to my dorm room at Anderson University in central Indiana. As I walked, I sensed an emptiness and brokenness like I had never experienced. When I got to my room, I immediately picked up the phone and called my wife. I want to be more committed to you, I said, and I want to be committed to Jesus. At that moment, I realized that God loved me. Not because I could run fast or jump high or because I was good or even what I could give to him. I realized that Jesus hung on the cross. 
I was forever loved and accepted by God. I realized my sin had been erased by Jesus' blood. It, it was there that I could see for the first time. That day I got infected with a virus called grace. And the symptoms are now full blown. Amen. You see, you are here and you have a story to tell. Maybe you're not a famous like Derwin Gray, but you have your share of troubles. And according to some, you have been through quite a bit. If the truth had been known, you struggle with your relationships, your works, and your daily responsibilities, and even your time demands. But that one thing is certain, you have a story. There is not one person that could not mention something that you have, uh, uh, could not, that you have been living through, and maybe some things that may be not pleasant. Your upbringing maybe was difficult, and your own choices led to going away from those people that cared about you. And finally, you started getting something figured out. But there is something many in this room need to understand. It is the abiding faith of the Lord Jesus Christ while you are here today in this room. You see, we don't claim to be perfect. We only claim to be forgiven. You see, we're here today celebrating what millions of believers do all over the world at this time. We come to worship the very God who loved us, shed His blood for us, and was wonderfully raised from the dead. You see, we are here to tell His story. But today... We're going to tell it in maybe a little different way. First of all, we're going to start where I believe it all begins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 3. The Apostle Paul writes it so aptly. For he says this, For I delivered unto you first of all which I have also received. Look at this. Here is the gospel in a nutshell. Here is what everybody in the room needs to know. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, if we didn't have any other story other than that, that's a pretty powerful story, amen? The beginning of the Lord's story is told to us in Luke chapter 1, verse number 34. Luke chapter 1, verse number 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of his highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And as our Lord grew in the home of Joseph and Mary, we find this incredible verse in Luke chapter 2, verse number 51. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and statue and favor with God and man. You see, history, listen to this, history is nothing more than his story. Amen. History is nothing more than his story. And that's what we're telling this morning. Listen, along the way, when Jesus was up on the earth, we see that he assisted very many needed people. Look, if you will, before we get to the main crux of the message this morning, John chapter 21, verse number 25. John chapter 21 and verse number 25. And there are also many other things, underscore that, which Jesus did to which... The which, if should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. You see, we only know part of his story. But what we will find out today, it should be enough to stir your soul. While on earth, our Lord made friends and enemies alike. But before we show you the main thoughts, consider Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 23. Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee. Look at this. Look at his ministry here. Teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel. Beloved, the gospel today is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus was preaching. Because his enemies were striving to have Jesus killed. Notice what the Bible records for us in Matthew chapter 26. And verse number 67. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 67. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ. 
Who is it that smote thee? Skip over to a chapter, Matthew chapter 27, verse number 29. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 29. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his hand and a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And notice this. And they spit upon him. And they took the reed and they smote him on the head. Are you still with me this morning? Matthew chapter 27, verse number 50. Very quickly, very quickly. Jesus, when he cried with a loud voice, the Bible says he yielded up the ghost. The end of Jesus was over as far as the religious leaders were concerned. The death of Jesus was a surprise to his disciples, although Christ had been telling them about this event. event, It was a joke to those who loved him, and it was not supposed to end this way. Now, everybody look up here. Now we get to the message. Now, I'm going to ask you to do a big favor for me this morning. I'm going to ask you to allow me have a little bit of liberties this morning. Will you allow me to do that? We're going to put on your imaginary hat this morning, and I'm just going to walk you through something that i like for you to see that emphasizes what we're going to be talking about for the remainder of this short message. Are you ready? Let's suppose. Let's suppose this morning that they wanted to have a funeral for Jesus. They printed it in a newspaper. They got the word out. And the meeting place was the garden tomb. So far, so good. But the time was a little bit different. It was on a Saturday night around midnight. All of these people started coming to that wonderful place (laughs) called the tomb. The people from all over, the curious as well as those that love Jesus came. Many eyewitnesses showed up to talk about the life and the ministry of Jesus. And, and, one, and people started saying this. If he was who he claimed to be, why could he not save himself? Amen. A legitimate question. How could the Messiah, many said, wind up in a buried, in a borrowed tomb? Confused and seized many until some began speaking aloud. One by one, stories were being told about all the things that Jesus did when he was here on earth. Can you imagine? Can you imagine blind Bartimaeus stepping up outside that garden tomb and saying, Jesus passed that way one time. Hey, can you imagine this? Blind Bartimaeus was telling his story outside the tomb. He, he said something like this. I heard that Jesus is coming my way, and and I started screaming, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And he said, the nerve of those people tried to tell me to be quiet, but Jesus was coming my way, and I wasn't going to be quiet. I shouted more, and more, and more. And finally, this man called Jesus, stepped forward, and asked me what I wanted. And Jesus healed my blinded eyes. People in that crowd outside of that garden tomb started clapping and, and wondering who it was. And in Mark chapter 10, verse number 47, and it says, When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, began to cry out and say, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried a more great deal, Son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> when blind Bartimaeus was finished. Then a silent woman walked through that crowd at that tomb. And she says, I've got a story to tell. She said, early one morning, I was, I was caught in the act of adultery. And they came and they grabbed me. And Jesus was at the temple. Jesus was at the temple. And they threw me in the temple at Jesus' feet. And she says, I knew what the crime, what the punishment was. And I embrace myself for the rocks to come my way. But Jesus did something strange that day. He did not condemn me, but rather he got down and started writing something in the dirt. I couldn't see what he wrote, but it was powerful enough that that whatever he wrote, that the people started going away. And she said, (laughs) she said, I lifted up my eyes and there was no one there but Jesus. Oh, it was Jesus. And in John chapter 8, verse number 10. And when Jesus lifted himself up and saw 
none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She says, No, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The woman kept telling that crowd, This man showed me more love than anyone ever showed me in all my life. Then the strange occurrence happened. As this lady quit telling her testimony, then another man came up in, at that late night and started telling his testimony, but he did so in a strange way. He just came and he started hopping. He just came and started leaping. This was the story he told. He said, for all of those years, I sat by that pool of Bethsaida. And all of those years, I watched people being healed when they could get into the water. But I could not do that. I was waiting for some man to put me in that healing stream. But no man put me into that stream. And all of that place and all of those porches that was around, Jesus just happened to come to me. And there were so many people out there that was wounded and hurting and afflicted. But Jesus, Jesus' eyes looked upon me, he said. And Jesus asked a strange request of me. He said this, what do you want? Oh, Lord, what do I want? I want a new car. No, that's not what he said. He said, Lord, (laughs) I love this. I just want to walk. John chapter 5 and verse number 9. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. He shared his story and he said like this. He said, crowd, I don't know about you, but I've just leapt and hopped ever since that beautiful day that Jesus touched me. (laughs) but when he finished telling his story a man cleared his throat and did something like this I was dead four days and my name is Lazarus you see my sisters (laughs) my sisters love the Lord Jesus with all their heart and they knew that I was dead Jesus waited a little while for he, for he reached my destination and my sisters came out and says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> Lazarus says, I was inside that old dark and lonely tomb and I heard something and it said something like this, Lazarus, come forth. And he says, <laughs> he says, my old bones begin to shake and to rattle one more time. And he said, I got up and I was still in those grave clothes and I was walking to the door of the tomb and I walked out. He said, I think some people passed out. Some people couldn't believe, but it was really me. I'm Lazarus and I'm alive. And Jesus did it all. How could it be? The crowd was saying, how could it be? Jesus says, loose him and let him go. (laughs) People were lining up. So people could hear their story. Those that loved the Lord were rejoicing all that they accomplished. No one wanted to leave and tears turned to joy. And sad faces began to smile. And they remembered the words that Jesus said in Matthew 14, 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And the Bible says, and he healed their sick. The noise of this celebration started reaching heaven outside of that garden tomb. Someone from the back of the crowd shouted, If they think they can keep a good man in the tomb, they don't know Jesus. Someone else reminded the crowd what Jesus said to Martha in John chapter 11, verse number 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. My friend, that's a promise to you and I. But the atmosphere changed. The next sounds the people heard that day were the groans and the sounds from hell. The place was shaken by evil laughter. As you finally guessed, Satan showed up. You see, he always wants to break in when people are worshiping the Lord. Satan began pacing up and down and saying the most vile and vulgar words. He looked at those who Jesus healed and whose bodies were now mended. Satan took no delight in anything that Jesus ever said and done. Satan, though, through his tight lips, smiled and said to the crowd, Your Jesus is dead. 
You cannot do anything about it. Satan loves seeing Jesus in pain and misery. You see, the Lord's story did not end in that tomb. A mighty rushing wind came on the scene as the angels came to deliver the news to Satan. He is not dead as you believe. We've come to show you in the world the good news of the gospel. And we're just getting started. The devil stepped back as the angel says, Make room for the king of kings and the lord of lords. Something was stirring inside that tomb. A bright light was shining through the darkness. Satan screamed a hellish scream. He told his demons to hold that stone back. Don't let that stone move. The devils pushed with all their might. But the glory of God was glowing like the morning sun. Satan reeked as death angel tried to hold Satan down and held Jesus down. But Jesus' body started moving. And oh, my friend, the scene started changing. The death angel screamed to Satan, Don't think we can hold him much longer. Satan screamed and says, Try with all your might. But death could not hold on. The thunder rolled and the ground shook. And Jesus walked out of that tomb. Satan trembled and the devils ran when the mighty voice of God called out and says, Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? Hell began to shake and to tremble. Heavens began to sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. The whole earth could applause of heaven as the angels started singing. God the Father rose from the throne as death had been defeated. And that massive celebration kept going on. Jesus rose with great power. And now all the world knows you can't keep a savior of the universe in a borrowed tomb. Satan lost the battle. And death has been defeated once and for all. You see, that is what makes your story that much more important. You have a story of what the Lord wants to do for you. And now you no longer have to be a victim to the whims and the wiles of the devil. Satan no longer has a sting of death over you, and Jesus defeated death for you. And my friend, listen to me once and for all. Your story could have a different ending today. Everybody has a story. Some here know that salvation is freely offered, and others may not know that story of Christ and His love. You see, many could tell the story of what Christ has done for them, while others are wondering if they've ever trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior in their hearts. Would you bow your head and close your eyes for me? I don't know where you are in your spiritual walk with Christ, but let this preacher say one more time, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. If you're here and you don't know him, And you've walked into this room and you said, Preacher, I have absolutely no hope of my eternal destiny. I don't know whether or not heaven would be my home. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It don't matter if you, at one time, you walked the aisle, but it never did make an impact in your life. It doesn't make a difference if you're grandma or grandpa. It don't make a difference if you're 10 years old or 90 years old. The difference it can make today is if you know Jesus as Savior. My Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But here's my favorite. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, the Bible says, they, thy, might be saved. Before we go on, before we walk out of the door this morning and close it up, let me ask you this question. Has there ever been a time in your life that you've accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior? You see, this is his story we're telling today. His story. But you get woven into this story by whether or not you accept him or you deny him. 
No one looking around, let me ask you this question. Preacher, I'm as sure of heaven of 100% that when I die, I know I'm going to heaven. Let me see your hands all over the room, all over the room. Preacher, I know 100%. Amen. Thank you for that. Preacher, this morning I could not say 100%. I may be 95% sure that I'm going to heaven, but I don't know 100%. I just don't know. Let me see your hands if that's you. I'm not going to come to you and embarrass you. I'm not going to come. Anybody else? Anyone else? Anyone else? I'm not going to come to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Just want to pray for you. Lord, there could be others in this room that never has accepted you as Savior. Please, Lord Jesus, I pray that they'll not walk out of this room lost and undone. This is His story we're talking about. But let it be our story when we complete that. Do you know Him? Would you stand to your feet this morning? If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, would you come? And let me pray for you. Let me just give you a word of encouragement. Just slip out. If you're in the middle of the road, that's okay. If you're on the end, somebody let them out. If you need to make that decision, come on and do so today. Brother Bruce.